Father in heaven, I humbly ask once again that you would put your words in my mouth and that you would help everyone to hear your word speaking to them. Lord, I recall the story of Balaam. He came to curse your people, but you put a word in his mouth. And Lord, I didn't come to curse anyone, but Lord, you need to put a word in my mouth just as you did for Balaam. And many of our prophets of the past, Lord, help us to hear you, not me, this morning. We thank you and we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Any of you uh, have those Waldo books? Maybe as a, as a kid, some of you did. That was probably one of my favorite things as a kid, just uh, to pull up, a, pull up a chair, sit, sit down on it, and sit down just for hours just looking for Waldo. <laughs> and this is for the kids who don't understand. Uh, this is before smartphones existed. <laughs> uh, this is before iPads were around. I mean, we had TVs, but, you know, a couple channels here and there. And so what do you do with your free time? Bike and where's Waldo? I mean, uh, that, was our, that was our free time. But I did some research just recently. I was reading an article on Waldo and the inspiration of who or, or what inspired the Where's Waldo series. And it was a very interesting story. About 300 years before the Protestant Reformation even began, there was a guy named Waldo, Peter Waldo, or uh, most, most uh, scholars, historians uh, call him. And he was a wealthy merchant who heard a little piece of the Bible about the rich young ruler. Jesus asked him to sell everything he had and come follow me. And the rich young r- ruler walked away sorrowful because he was very wealthy. Waldo heard this story. Back in the 11th century, he was so touched, he sold everything he had, hired a scholar to translate the Bible into the modern language, a language similar to French, he translated it into the modern language and started making copies after copies after copies of the Bible and passing them out for free. Back when there wasn't Bibles really to go around, he was making it available. Well, the local bishops heard about this, and they didn't like Waldo's preaching and sharing of the Bibles. And uh, he almost got excommunicated, but he p- appealed to Pope Alexander III. And Pope Alexander heard his story. He said, you know... As long as the bishops are okay with it, you go ahead. Well, none of the bishops were okay with it, but he went ahead anyways. <laughs> After uh, a few years of this going on, him wrestling with the local bishops, a new pope was, uh, was brought to the, to the plate, Pope uh, Louis III, and he didn't like Waldo very much at all and excommunicated him on 1184. And that was really the best thing you could do for Waldo. <laughs> he once excommunicated from the church, it fueled him to work with more diligence and more earnestness than he ever worked before. He became preaching nonstop. They were called the poor boys of France, of lion France. And he preached relentlessly to the crowds. He made copies of the Bible. He started selling them because he was running out of money. And uh, he needed money to keep the translations and the copies of the Bibles going. He learned how to make his own copies. He taught other people to make copies of the Bible. Eventually, due to persecution, Waldo had to leave his home in Lyon, France, and move up into the mountains, um, uh, Swiss Alps. Many of his followers moved up there with him, and, and in Piedmont. The descendants of Waldo, any guesses of what they're called today? The Waldensians. The Waldensians. Little... Little is recorded, um, but some very powerful things are recorded of the followers of Waldo or the Waldensians. Some, some 7,000 Waldensians were killed. 8,000 were imprisoned for their faith, for their desire to keep the Bible when the Bible was illegal. For their desires to, to go to the, boldly to the throne of grace rather than to the Pope's throne for, for freedom, for, for forgiveness. But today, I have a question for you, is where are the Waldos today? Where, where are the Waldensians, the modern-day Waldensians today? And no, I'm not talking about the, the 25,000 Waldensians that still go to our churches across the, uh, the, not just the country, but the world. There's about 5,000 Waldensians still in the United States. But the, the, the real Waldensians, the, weir, the rear, real Where's Waldos, and not the cartoon that's fun to enjoy, the guy who gave up everything 
to follow Christ, who became hated by his friends, who lived up in a high elevation place, probably without a wood stove, <laughs> at least like what we have today, who sacrificed much to follow Christ and share Christ. Today, as we look for Waldo, I'm going to pull out three different highlights, really kind of two and a half, on our journey to find the Waldensians in modern day, uh, day world. If you're taking uh, notes, feel, feel free to take out uh, a pen and paper and take some notes on a couple of these verses we're going to look at. Um, but the first point that I want to highlight on looking for the Waldensians in modern day, the, the history of what the Waldensians did, is I want you to go to 2 Timothy 3.15. 2 Timothy 3.15, the Waldensians took this verse incredibly seriously. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Some of you may have it memorized even. And it says, And that from what? Childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And that from what was the word again? Childhood. The Waldensians took this verse so seriously that their children memorized not just verses, but entire books of the Bible. Their parents believed that at any moment they may have to run for their lives, and they didn't want to lose the most precious thing on the planet, and that was the Bible. So these children memorized. Could you imagine your child memorizing the entire book of Matthew? <laughs> word for word. I mean, look, think of Genesis. <laughs> memorizing Genesis. The Waldensian children believed that the Bible was so precious they had, they had no choice, but they had to memorize it. Look on the ver next verse, verse 16, and it says, All scripture was given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you had the NIV version, I really like how it says that all scripture, or God breathed. Um, all scripture is God breathed. And I like how that is stated because it's true. God's breath is the Bible. You didn't, you didn't catch that. The Holy Word of God is God's breath. The Bible is God's breath. When, when God knelt down to, to kneel before in this pile of clay known as Adam, this clay turned into life after what? God breathed. The Waldensians, the Waldos believed that God's breath had such power to bring life that they wanted it downloaded. <laughs> inside of their bodies. God's living breath inside of me. You know, church, let's be honest, we need to be recreated, amen? I mean, not just eternally, that's going to happen, but now we need, need to be recreated. We're, we're selfish. We're lazy. We're irritable. You, you, you name it, we, we need God to recreate that, His image in us. Amen? Amen? And the Waldensians believed if they put God's breath, his words, inside of their mind, it would change them. And friends, it's true. Spending time with God in his word changes us. And the Waldos understood that. That they could be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I don't think there's anyone here that doesn't like the idea of working for Christ. I think all of us have that desire. You may not know what to do. You may have a million other things going on in your life. And you just feel like you're too busy to, to really give your all. But this leads us to our second point as the Waldensians, the Waldos, as we look for, for Waldo on our spiritual book, the, the next thing that jumps out to me is that the Waldensians had a balanced understanding of the mission of Christ. Let me, let me open that up for you. Uh, go with me to, uh, to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And I want to read this story with you. 
You know, it's, it's a common one, but there's so many good highlights. I want to read the entire uh, 5 all the way to 20. Um, uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gardenes, where they had come out on a boat. Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with what? Unclean spirit. He was a demon possessed man. And who had dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him. Could you imagine that? This guy is so controlled by the devil, he can break chains. And shackles and broken pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Could you imagine walking in the evening and hearing that? <laughs> I don't know what it sounded like. It was creepy. <clears throat> when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, the Most High God? I, what's the word? I implore you, I beseech you by, by God that you do not torment me. For he said, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he also did what? He begged him that earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now a large, sign, a large herd of swine was there near the mountains. And all the demons did what? Begged him... <laughs> that they may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission that the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about how many? I need you to do me a favor. I know we're in the church and we're not used to moving, but everyone kind of like do uh, a stomp on the ground a little bit. Okay, everyone. I need everyone. Come on, everyone. Stomp on the ground real quick. There was about 2,000 swine. The sound that we're making right now is probably the sound that they heard. That's a lot of pigs. And they, and they ran violently, not just casually, violently to the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine and told him in the city and the country what had happened, they went to came to Jesus and uh, saw the one who was demon-possessed <laughs> sitting clothed in his right mind and were afraid. And those who saw it uh, told him what had happened about the demon-possessed and the swine then they begged Jesus and pleaded with him to depart from the region. They're freaking out. They see Jesus who did this miracle, and they're scared to death. And Jesus, when he got to the boat, who had, he, when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed did what? Begged him that he might be with him. Then what did Jesus say? Are you guys tracking with me? What did Jesus say to this formerly demon-possessed man? Friends, I, I need to unpack this with you. I said the Waldensians had a, a, a proper biblical understanding of the mission of Christ. And of prayer, for that matter. The demons asked Jesus, begged Jesus, three different times for a favor. And Jesus answered the prayers of these murderous, evil demons. Did we catch that in the story? How much more does Jesus want to answer your prayers? You're not demons. I don't care what you've done. God answered the prayer of demons. He wants to answer our prayers. Amen? Amen? He wants to answer our prayers. Then we look at the former demon-possessed man. Now, let's do a little back check on this guy. You don't just get demon-possessed just out of the blue. Amen? Amen. He's, been, he's been playing with the devil for some time. He's made a lot of poor decisions in his life. Until he got to the point where the devil literally just took over him. So this guy who was scum, he made lots of bad decisions. He was probably tatted up, didn't know any good form of vocabulary, and to terrible slang, you could say, looked rough, no education. He asks Jesus to go with him. I mean, this guy's probably terrified himself. He's been demon-possessed. He doesn't want to go back to that lifestyle. I can't be safe alone, Jesus. 
Let me go with you, please. And Jesus says, no. <laughs> like in my, in my mind, it doesn't make sense. Out of all the things that Jesus would want, it, it seems like Jesus would want us to be with him. Amen? Amen? But the thing that Jesus wants more than us to be with him is to have us go for him. <laughs> I mean, and this guy of all people. <laughs> Friends, you are miles ahead of this demon-possessed man. Do not tell me you can't work for Christ. Amen. Do and share what you have. Amen? Amen? You have something. Share it. You may not feel talented enough. You might not feel good enough. You might, you, whatever excuses, the devil's putting those in your mind. But remember the demon-possessed man when next time you're getting scared to share Christ and be reminded that Jesus wants you to go for him more than he even wants you to come for him. He wants you to go for him. Amen? The Waldensians uh, viewed this as a priority in their lives. They couldn't just hide from persecution. They had to share Jesus. 8,000 were killed in an attempt to share Christ. 2,000, 1,800 in one day. Friends, what's our excuses? Amen. We must adopt the lifestyle of these Waldensians. One of the books that made a big impact in my personal life and my prayer life is a, a book by Roger, I never say his name right, but Merneau, Merneau. many of you have, have, uh, have read this book, uh, A Trip into the Supernatural. This guy, Roger, was Canadian. He, he, uh, he became, uh, due to his hatred toward God and misconceptions of God, became a worshiper of the devil. They'd have church services, singing hymns, but they're directed to Satan instead of God. And God, or Satan gave him spiritual gifts. He was told the, the winners of these horse races. And eventually he ran into a Seventh-day Adventist, started Bible studies, and as he was going through the Bible studies very, very quickly, he knew what he was getting into, and he knew that because of these decisions of studying the Bible, he would probably be killed. But he wanted to know the truth anyways. God preserved his life. And when he became a Christian, the faith that he had in Satan morphed into even more faith that he had in God. He prayed and things happened because he trusted they would happen. Friends, we need to have that confidence. God wants to answer our prayers. He wants to use us. He longs to do great things for us. We just got to start with what we have. Amen. Amen. One more highlight from the, the Waldensians. Number three is my favorite personally. Everyone in the Waldensian culture was a literature evangelist. Amen. All right. <laughs> Uh, some of you didn't, didn't like that, but let me say it again. <laughs> Everyone Amen. in the Waldensian culture, the grandmas, All right. the old men, Come on. Uh -huh. the children, Preach. were literature evangelists. Yeah. I mean, you read the history. I'm speaking of the choir here. The kids were raised to memorize the Bible. They wanted the kids, yeah, to get an education, but more than that, they wanted their kids to be missionaries. So they'd send them to the public schools <laughs> to get an education. And they, they'd make copies as they're doing their homework. And then when they saw a safe opportunity, they'd pull out that copy of the Bible, hand it to a classmate. The classmate would like it, he'd hand it to someone else. <laughs> Huge revivals happen as a result of literature being shared from these kids. Their parents, they, they grow crops in high elevation. I don't know how they did that. They, they may have found these gems and made little jewelry or whatever. They go into the cities. Waldo might have walked back into the lion. He needed, needed a few more dollars. He looked like a merchant. Many of us are merchants today. <laughs> He'd have clothes specifically designed, designed to conceal the Bible that was in his coats. And we saw 
and felt there was a safe opportunity, he'd pull that scripture out and share it. <laughs> Sometimes probably people shared it to the wrong person and they got killed for it. Very likely. But everyone was a literature evangelist. How many of you are, are sharing literature? I got this big old rock in the back. Anyone take any literature off lately? And that was not rhetorical. Anyone take literature off lately? Church. Waldo shares literature. It's interesting, looking at the culture during the Dark Ages when the Waldensians were very active, they had a lot of obstacles. If they publicly spoke, they were killed. They had to be a little more tactful. You know, in our culture today, you can, we can preach publicly. It's not going to, you know, get anyone killed. At least not anytime soon. Hopefully. <laughs> but there's still a lot of prejudice, right? And, and I think we need to adopt the witnessing strategy of the Waldensians today. You might not be able to stand on a, on a street corner and preach the gospel and have anyone listen to you. But you can pass out a little Bible pamphlet to the guy at Taco Bell and say, hey, I really enjoyed this. Tell me what you think about it. Amen? That can be preaching just as much as standing on the street, street corner. And we need people to be coming to these meetings. Amen? And I'm, I'm a pastor, how many, uh, how many advertisements do we have? 10,000 mailers. And any more that we can pass out by hand? Another thousand. Church, we can do that today. <laughs> The Waldensians were literature evangelists. I don't want to read a few highlights from my good old trustworthy Cole Porter ministry. The publishing branch of a cause has much to do with our power. Speaking of our church. I desire that it shall accomplish all that the Lord has designed it should. In other words, it might not if we don't participate in it. But it can if we participate. Amen? Amen. If our bookmen, that's you and I, do their part faithfully, I know from the light that God has given me that the knowledge of present truth will be doubled and tripled. Amen? All right, you need another one. Uh, this is from uh, Far Reaching Influence, by the way. I saw them holding papers and tracts in one hand and the Bible in the other. While their cheeks were wet with tears and bowing before God with earnest, humble prayer to be guided into all truth, the very thing he was doing for them before they asked. And when the truth was received in their hearts, they saw the harmonious chain of truth. The Bible to, the, to them was a new book. They hugged it close to their hearts with grateful joy while their countenances were aglow with happiness and holy joy. <laughs> one more, one more. Then I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, maybe, maybe two more. We'll see. One more. Okay. It is true that some buy the books and lay them on the shelf for pl uh, or lay them on a shelf or place them on a parlor table and seldom look at them. People buy our books and sometimes they don't look at them right away. Still, God has a care for His truth. Everyone say Amen. amen. The time will come when these books will be will be sought for and read. Sickness or misfortune may enter the home, and through the truth contained in those books, God will send, send to troubled hearts peace and hope and rest. Church, don't make me read one more. God will soon do, so, God will soon, soon do great things for us if we lie humble, believing at his feet. More than 1,000 will be soon converted in a day, most of whom will trace their first convictions to the reading of our publications. Friends, it just goes on and on and on. The Waldensians were literature evangelists because it was a season of great persecution. We might not see the great persecution today, but there is just as much prejudice in our culture today. I encourage you to preach the gospel using literature today as well. Amen? Amen. This, I mentioned this last week, was, was difficult. On, uh, my wife and I are, are doing foster care for for a few young children, a one-year-old and two-year-old, and you come say hi to them later. But on Thursday, our little foster girl was not feeling very good. So we took her to the doctor, and the doctor said she had an attachment disorder, and she just was just really out of it. And uh, we brought her home and just tried to love and snuggle and, you know, just make her feel supported. 
But she just kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker and out more out of it and more out of it and more out of it, sleeping all the time. And we're like, what is going on with this girl? And so we took her, I took her on Sunday morning to the, the pediatric urgent care down the street. The pediatric urgent care, I'd never seen them move so fast in my life. They did a couple checks here and there and then they had an ambulance on the way. And they says, this girl has diabetes and is doing really bad. And so they threw in an ambulance, basically. I followed them here to Fort Collins into the ER. They had doctors everywhere and nurses everywhere. And they were poking and prodding and, and drilling and doing all kinds of things to try to get her, her uh, glucose levels down. It was over 600. And uh, eventually they're like, hey, we need to get her down to Children's Hospital in Denver. So they called a helicopter, put her in a helicopter, flew down to Denver. We were in the hospital until uh, Thursday and finally let her go. <laughs> to say that it was a tiring event would be an understatement. <laughs> I don't know why they did this, but two in the morning, they said, hey, we're moving you out of the ICU on Wednesday. I'm like, really, right now? <laughs> I'm so tired. You know, but there's lack of sleep, nurses coming and going, doctors coming and going. It was exhausting. But if you go to Pollock, you'll see a smile on her face. You'll see her running around. She, she groaned and whined and hit me when I gave her a shot the other day. <laughs> but five minutes later, she was sitting on my lap playing with me. Friends, Many of us have grown weary in well-doing. It's true. But do not lose hope. For in due season you will get a reward greater than the smile on this little girl's face. Amen? Amen? Do not grow weary. It is worth the effort, the struggle, the financial loss, the rejection, the potential dirty looks. I get them from her all the time the dirty looks, it's worth it because in the end we will have reward and so will they if we do not give up. There's an outreach this afternoon. I want to encourage you to participate. Do one door, go to the gas station, drop off a card. I don't care. Do something for the Lord today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Wait, do, do, do today. Amen? We have an evangelistic series coming up very soon. Participate by coming, if nothing else. Amen. You can be a friend to someone that, that you can connect with someone that might come and really appreciate your friendship. Friends, the bottom line is, do not give up. Do not get worn out. For you will have your word now and the life to come. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just humbly ask that you'll bless us as a church. Help us to find the passion that Waldo had. Help us to live the lifestyle that Waldo had. Lord, we're, we're needing you to revive us. We know you're coming soon. And help us to not get worn out at the very end, but more earnestly put our efforts and be revived as we see success from those efforts. Lord, just bless us. We thank you and pray in your name. Amen.